Good afternoon. So welcome to this week's uh, session. Uh, I hope you all um, are in tune with what we did in the last class. So in the last class I introduced you to Gauss's law and uh, how we can apply and uh, we saw the concept of uh, flux density. So in um, this class let's uh, try to see some more uh, problems in cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates etc. and also try to bring in the concept of uh, energy in the presence of an electric field. Okay, So here we go. Now I have a problem here. I have a point charge of 20 nanocoulombs located at the point 4 minus 1 3 and a uniform line charge of minus 25 nanocoulombs are uh, lying along the intersection of the planes x is equal to minus 4 and z equal to 6 right so i want you to calculate d at the point 3 minus 1 0 so now if you remember d obeys superposition and uh, in free space d is equal to epsilon naught uh, e right so now i have a i have a point charge and i have a i have a line charge so my d the flux density at any point is the superposition of the flux density due to both these so now let me take the first the point charge it's located at 4 minus 1 3 and this is my point where I want to find D. Right? So, what is the vector? Uh, recollect again and again, every class I'm repeating the vector between any two points is the destination minus the source. Right? So, here this is my field, the point and where I want to find the field, and this is the point of my charge. So, 3 minus 4 is minus AX. And minus 1 minus of minus 1 is 0 and 0 minus 3 is minus 3 is z. So the vector between these two points is given by minus ax minus 3 az. Okay. And uh, so what will be the field due to the uh, point charge? The flux density will be q by 4 pi r squared. So r squared would be root of, you see this is the vector, so it would be root of 1 plus 9 and uh, uh, so it is 2 divided by 4 pi r, sorry q divided by 4 pi r squared along the direction of the unit vector. So now what's the direction of the unit vector? It is a vector divided by its magnitude, right? So this part, the first term gives me the flux density at point due to the point charge right now let's take the line charge so what's the flux density it is lambda by 2 pi r or rho okay so what is it rho is what rho is the radial distance between the two uh, points so now i have a line charge at the intersection of x equal to minus 4 and z equal to 0 so what are the coordinates of the line charge it would be minus 1 sorry minus 4 y and 6 so you should remember from my discussions in the previous class that this line charge will now be parallel to y axis okay so what is the component which which the field will not have it will not have the y component so when you take the radial distance don't consider the y component so now let's see the radial distance between these two points so it is 3 minus of minus 4 that is 7 7 ax and it is so don't take the y component go to the z 0 minus 6 which is minus 6 az okay so what is the 7 a ax minus 6 az that's the radial distance of the line charge and the point where you want to find out the flux density. And what's the flux density? Q by 2 pi r rho. Okay. So root of rho would be root of 49 plus 36. 
along the unit radial vector so that would be 7 a x minus 6 a z divided by its magnitude which is root of 49 plus 36. So here I have the flux density due to the point charge and the flux density due to the line charge the sum of this will give me the flux density at this point okay so this is just simple if you simplify the arithmetics you would get this and what is the unit nano coulomb per meter square okay so this is uh, you know we have done with cartesian coordinates so now let's see so now with the same same charge configuration what do we have considered that is a point charge and a line charge how much electric flux would leave the surface of a sphere of radius 5 centered at the origin now come back let's see what's the meaning so you see I have a point charge at 4 minus 1 3 and I have a line charge here at minus 4 y 6 I, so when, when I have these two charges now I have a sphere okay of radius 5 meters centered at the origin so how much of flux leaves the sphere so what do I have to do I have to find out what is the charge inside the sphere right okay are you are you getting it if you have the origin you have a sphere around the origin and the radius is 5 meters so now let me find out at what radial distance this point charge lies so if you look at this the point charge lies at a distance of 5.1 meters from the origin look at this the coordinates of the point charge is 4 minus 1 3 so its distance from the origin would be root of 16 plus 1 plus 9 which happens to be 5.1 okay so what does this mean this means that my point charge is located at a distance of 5.1 meters from the origin right now where is the sphere I am considering I am considering a sphere at a radius of 5 meters from the origin right so obviously this point charge of 5 point which is at a distance of 5.1 will lie outside my sphere under consideration therefore this will not contribute anything to the flux density clear do you remember in Gauss law integral d dot ds is equal to q enclosed so I have to look at the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface. So the point charge is not enclosed by the Gaussian surface because it lies at a point outside the sphere of 5 meters. And now let's take the line charge. Okay, so what are the coordinates of the line charge? It is minus 4, right, y and 6. Okay, so which point would be closest to the origin? obviously it would be minus 4 0 and 6 right so what would it, what would its distance be from the origin so it would be minus 4 that would be root of 16 plus 36 because y is 0 at the origin also y is 0 so 16 root 16 plus, are, you, are you understanding I am having the line charge right and the coordinates of this line charge are minus 4 y 6 so obviously the one the point the value of y closest to the origin is y equal to 0 any other point would be more further away from the origin so even at the point closest to the origin the radial distance of the line charge from the origin would be 7.2 okay therefore what happens the entire line and what is my sphere my sphere is 5 meters okay and the shortest distance of the line charge is at 7.2 meters from the origin so therefore the entire line charge lies outside my Gaussian surface and we saw the point charge if this is 5 meters my point charge lies at 5.1 so that also lies outside therefore if you consider a sphere of radius 5 meters center at the origin the given flux the, sorry the given charge configuration does not contribute to any flux density in the sphere that means the sphere basically does not enclose either the line charge or the point charge clear so now let me take the same point and say what happens if the radius of the sphere is 10 meters instead of 5 so now I have a sphere of 10 meters 
okay and what was the radial distance of the point charge it was 5.1 meters so obviously the point charge lies inside this gaussian surface yes okay fine now what about my line charge we saw the closest point of the line charge is at 7.2 meters obviously some part so you see if you, if you have a thing like this and I would I will just show you with a pen so I would have the line charge like this extending from plus infinity to minus infinity and this is my sphere my hands are my sphere at a radius of 10 meters so can you see and where is the center the center of the sphere is the origin okay so can you see that partially the line charge lies within the sphere yes so now what do I have to do I have to solve for what is the length inside okay so what is the length inside so what does it mean so from the origin when I take right the distance of the line charge should maximum distance should be 10 meters so that is the length which will lie inside the sphere are you trying to get what I'm saying so I have a sphere I have the line charge inside the sphere and I want to find out what length of the line charge lies inside the sphere. So what is the radius of the sphere? Radius is 10 meters. So I have to find out for what value of y this is 10 meters. So I just say root of 16, this is 4, minus 4, 4 square, 16, plus y naught square, that plus 6 square, this should be equal to 10. What is this? This is the radial distance, maximum distance of the line charge, which will lie on the surface of the sphere. Okay. So if I solve for this, I get y naught is equal to 6.93. And why did I multiply by 2? You see here? So from the center when I take, this length is 6.93. That is from the origin to the surface of the sphere. So similarly, I have the other part of the line charge from the origin to the surface on both sides. So that would be 2 into y naught, 13.86. Okay, so that means the length of the line charge is 13.86 lies inside. That is the length which lies inside the sphere under consideration. So then it is simple. So once you know how much of the line charge, so I get the total flux is the Q enclosed, that is the point charge minus the line charge. Point charge is 20 nanocoulombs, line charge is minus 25 nanocoulombs per meter and 13.86 meters lies within. So you see that diameter of the sphere is 20, radius is 10, diameter is 20, but the entire 20 doesn't have the line charge. So the line charge is only 13.86. So the total charge enclosed is minus 3. 26 nanocoulombs so that and we saw Gauss's law which says that the total flux enclosed within a closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed okay so this is one application so now so so long we considered some constant uh, charges right so now let's see what happens if the charge is not a constant but depends on one of the parameters okay so consider this problem. The cylindrical surface, rho equal to 8 centimeter. So you see I have a cylinder, cylindrical surface and rho is equal to, the radius is 8 centimeters. It contains a surface charge density equal to 5E minus 20 magnitude of Z nano coulombs per meter square. So you see here, the surface charge density is not a constant, but is a function of Z. Now, what is the total amount of charge present? Okay, so you see how much, what is the variable, what, what have I told, I have a cylindrical surface, right? The radius of the surface is 8 centimeters. I have given you the charge density, the charge density is a function of Z. Now, I want to find what is the total amount of charge present on this. So what is the variation in Z? It is obviously from minus infinity to plus infinity. Clear? So or I can say the line is uniform from the origin along the Z axis. It extends to plus infinity on one side and minus infinity on the other side. So in what can I do? I can take the limit from and since it is 
charged here it is magnitude of z so from 0 to infinity or 0 to minus infinity the norm will be the same and therefore i will take it as 2 times that means i'm going to integrate only from 0 to infinity and multiply it by 2 because it is symmetrical okay the charge is symmetrical so 0 to 2 and what is the variation in z 0 to infinity this 2 remember is because or i can take here from minus infinity to plus infinity instead of that i am taking from 0 to infinity and multiplying by 2 please remember i am able to do this because here it is magnitude of z and not z if it is z you can't do this okay so it is 0 to infinity and phi varies from 0 to 2 pi right i need the area cylindrical surface area so what is the surface area of the cylinder cylindrical surface area rho d phi dz you remember uh, uh, earlier when we did vector uh, uh, algebra we saw different surfaces so the cylindrical surface area is given by rho d phi dz okay so what is the total charge you know this this is the limit of phi from 0 to 2 pi and z varies from 0 to infinity this is my surface charge density phi into e to the power of minus 20 z area rho rho is 8 centimeters that is 0 0.08 meters d phi dz nano coulombs okay so this 0 to 2 pi d phi would give you 2 pi okay it will give you 2 pi and then this 5 into 2 20 into 2 uh, 5 into 2 10 into 2 pi 20 pi i have rho here 0 0.08 and integral of 5 e to the power of minus 20 z that is minus 1 by 20 e to the power of minus 20 z as z takes the limit from 0 to infinity and this works out to be 0 0.25 nano coulombs ah now you see infinities actually you know may not be infinite what do you have here you have a cylindrical surface extending from z equal to minus infinity to plus infinity right with some charge density and immediately for a novice you would be you know tempted to think that the total charge is infinite because you know the surface extends from minus infinity to plus infinity but no it is not infinite it is simply 0 0.25 0 0.25 nano coulombs okay fine now so this is infinite now let's see what happens if the charge is of finite length okay so how much leaves the how much of flux leaves the surface same radius is same 8 centimeters and z varies from 1 centimeter to 5 centimeters and phi varies from 30 degrees to 90 degrees same thing integral okay and what is the uh, variation in z from 0.01 to 0.05 1 to 5 centimeters integral phi is from 30 degrees to 90 degrees this is my charge density 0 0.08 rho d phi dz clear so remember when you put this 30 degrees 90 degrees so integral of d phi is phi don't make the mistake of putting the limits as 90 minus 30 no it should always be any absolute degrees should be in radians that's why here it's 90 minus 30 by 360 you know that is to convert it into radians if you use absolute values of uh, angles in degrees you will end up with wrong answers okay so whenever you get an ang absolute angle phi it should always be in radians and not in degrees okay so integral of d phi is phi and integral of dz is z so z varies from 0.01 to 0.05 so you get 9.45 pico coulombs okay got it now what's new in this problem we saw a couple of things the new thing is the charge density is now not uniform it's a function of one of the coordinates so in this particular problem it's a function of the z coordinate okay now let's take one more so i have so that was a line charge 
Now I'll take a volume charge. That was a sorry, it was not a line charge, it was a surface charge. Surface on a cylinder. So now I'll take a volume charge. A volume charge density is located in free space and rho V, that is the volume charge density, is given by 2 into e to the power of minus 1000 r nano coulomb per meter square for r from 0 to 1 millimeter and it is 0 everywhere. So what does it mean? It's obviously a spherical uh, system. So I have a spherical, I have a sphere, okay, and from 0 to 1 mm radius, it is charged throughout. It's a solid sphere. It's a solid sphere, okay, because from 0 to 1, it is not surface. It is solid. That means it's a volume. Throughout the volume of the sphere, whose radius is 1 meter, 1 millimeter, the surface, the density, volume charge density is 2 into e to the power of minus 1000 r nano coulomb per meter cubed the unit will tell you whether it is surface charge or volume charge nano coulombs per meter square is surface nano coulombs per meter cubed is volume nano coulombs per meter is line charge just nano coulombs is point charge so find the total charge enclosed by the spherical surface r is equal to 1 mm so you understood what it is i have a solid wall solid volume of 1 mm now in this 1 m what is the charge enclosed total charge enclosed so it's a triple integral because it is it is a volume charge it is triple integral so q is equal to 0 to 2 pi this is their variation in phi and integral 0 to pi this is the variation in theta of the spherical coordinate, the coordinates and this is the radius from 0 to 0 0.001 that is mm 2 into e to the power of minus 1000 r this is your volume charge density and the volume is volume in spherical coordinates is r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi okay here don't make the mistake of multiplying the charge density with some 4 by 3 pi r cube which is the volume of the sphere you can do it provided you know the volume charge density is uniform supposing you have a sphere which is uniformly charged with some density rho then you can simply multiply it by the volume of the sphere which is 4, 4 by 3 pi r cubed okay but in this case you cannot do it because the charge is not uniform but is a function of the radius r so you have to do the integral so now when you integrate the angle from 0 to pi and here i have sine theta so that would be cos theta okay and i i do all this into from here it is integration field theory ends here i get 4 into 10 to the power of minus 9 nano coulombs now all of you the integrals look simple but very often students make mistake in that so kindly work out the intervals properly so the the limits on the integrals you have to do it correctly so i get this now in the same problem by using gauss's law calculate the value of d on the surface so what did i see i saw a sphere volume solid charged now I want the flux density at the surface. So at the surface, what is the charge enclosed? The, all the charge is enclosed because the surface is at 1 mm and inside I have the charge. So the entire charge is enclosed. So what is my Gauss's law? D integral ds, integral of ds is 4 pi r squared. So d is equal to q by 4 pi r squared and I get 3.2 into 10 to the power of minus 4 nano coulombs per meter square. So, but one thing remember, whether you have point charge or, or line charge or volume charge or surface charge, D is nano coulombs per meter square only. Okay. So, it is integral of D dot DS, which is Q, which can take on different units, nano coulombs per meter cubed or so on. Okay. That, that is the densities. So D is always nano coulombs per meter square. It has the dimensions of a surface charge density. Understood? Okay. 
So now let's do one more thing, simple things, quickly. So I won't spend too much time in the next one or two problems. So now I, my, my problem is simpler here because I have a uniform volume charge density of 80 microcoulombs per meter cubed present in the region 8 mm is less than R is less than 10 mm. Okay? And rho V is 0 for R less than 8 mm. You understand? I have a sphere inside up to 8 mm there is no charge. Okay? And between 8 and 10 I have a uniform charge density. Find the total charge inside the spherical surface of R equal to 10 mm. This is simple. So just see how I have put the limits. This is the same. This is the charge density, 80 microcoulombs. Volume is R squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. This doesn't change. This is the volume of a sphere. Now the limits. The limit of R is from 8 mm to 10 mm. So 0.008 to 0.0. 1 and the limit of theta is again from 0 to pi and limit of phi is from 0 to 2 pi so here it is simple I have only r squared so the integral of r squared is r cubed by 3 so I get 164 picocoulombs so this integral is slightly simpler than the previous one because the charge density is uniform now for the same problem find d at r equal to 10 mm so now you know this is the total charge, right? So 10 mm is at the surface, so it encloses all the charge. So the total charge enclosed is actually the charge calculated in the previous case, which is 164 picocoulombs divided by 4 pi r squared, that is 10 mm squared. That gives me 130 nanocoulombs per meter square, right? Again, now. If there is no charge for r greater than 10 mm, that means I. I only between 8 mm and 10 mm I have charge less than 8 mm no charge greater than 10 mm no charge something like your coaxial cable similar to that no nothing outside so what will be the field density the flux density at r equal to 20 mm okay so my surface is at 10 mm r is at 20 mm so what will be my Gaussian surface my Gaussian surface has to pass through the point so I will take my Gaussian surface. Remember the rules for Gaussian surface? There has to be symmetry. So I will choose a concentric sphere of radius 20 mm. Now what is the charge? So you see this is my Gaussian sphere is outside. So what is the charge enclosed? It's the total charge, right? So D is the total charge is again 164 divided by area of the Gaussian surface so that's why I have taken the radius as 20 mm, that is 0 0.02 meters. I get 32.5 nanocoulombs per meter square. Always please be very careful when you apply Gauss's law because on the left hand side I have area of the Gaussian surface that is integral d dot ds. There ds is the Gaussian surface and when you evaluate q you will be using the surfaces of the charge. Don't make the mistake of interchanging that. Fine. Now I have put in here one more problem in cylindrical coordinates. So here the volume rho v is equal to 0 for r less than 1 mm and rho v is equal to 2 sine 2000 pi rho nano coulombs per meter cubed for 1 mm less than rho less than 1.5 mm and again it is 0 everywhere. See the previous case what I took I considered a cylindrical surface right now it is a cylinder but it is not surface it is volume charge okay and where is the volume the volume is from a radius of 1 mm to a radius of 1.5 mm so in that 1 mm to 1.5 mm thickness so I have the in that volume I have the charge spread out and again the charge is not uniform it is 2 sine 2000 pi rho it's a function of rho okay so now find d everywhere find d everywhere so what all do i need i have i have the cylinder from 1 mm to 1.5 mm so there are three regions of uh, interest the first is where rho is less than 1 mm that is inside and second one is when rho is in between 1 and 1.5 and the third is when rho is outside okay 
So now when rho is inside the inner cylinder, obviously D is zero because it will not enclose any charge. You get it? When rho is inside, it will not enclose any charge. So now let's say what happens if rho is less than uh, you know in between 1 and 1.5 so using Gauss's law I have D rho and the cylindrical surface area for unit length would be 2 pi rho okay and then on the right hand side the charge enclosed is this is the charge density 2 into nanocoulombs this 10 to the power of 9 minus 9 is because of nanocoulombs sine 2000 pi I have used the integral uh, variable as rho dash rho dash d phi rho d rho dash d phi rho so again if you do this integral it will work out to be some function okay so what i want to want to draw your attention to is this integral is simple okay you just have to work it out but what you should see here is the flux density is a function of rho right for all all values where rho is from 1 mm to 1.5 mm, you can evaluate D at any point you so desire. Okay. Now, let's find out what happens if rho is greater than 1.5 mm. So now, if rho is greater than 1.5 mm, then I will find the total charge. Okay. So the total charge I can get by here, in on this right hand side so this integral instead of being from 1 mm to rho it will be from 1 mm to 1.5 mm so this integral on the right hand side will give me the total charge enclosed divided by 2 pi rho will give me the flux density at any point so that works out to be 2.5 into 10 to the power of minus 15 pi rho am i clear now so in all these problems we are seeing, what is important for you is to visualize. So any point where you have to find the flux density, first identify a Gaussian surface and then you see which is the charge configuration which will lie within the surface and then evaluate how much of charge lies there and then apply Gauss's law. So we will take one last problem. Okay, spherical surfaces at r equal to 2, 4 and 6 meters carry uniform surface charge densities and again be very clear whether it is surface or volume because a sphere can either be a surface charge or it can have a volume charge so be very clear about that so carries uniform surface charge densities of 20 nano coulombs per meter square and minus 4 nano coulombs per meter square and some density rho s not and not specified respectively so find D at R equal to 1, 3 and 5 meters. So now I have just crudely drawn a figure here. So I have R equal to 2, 3 blacks I have put. Okay. So one is at 2, one is at 4 and one is at 6. So these are three concentric spherical surfaces charged with some charge density. Okay. Now I want you to find out first D at R equal to 1. Okay, so where is R equal to 1? The first sphere itself is at charge sphere is at R equal to 2. So this red circle, can you see this is at R equal to 1? It lies inside. Does it enclose any charge? No, because my first charge itself is outside. So obviously the field at R equal to 1 would be 0. Next I want at R equal to 3. Where is at R equal to 3? If you look at these two black circles, they are actually spears, cross section of, of a spear. This is at 2 and this is at 4. So 3 will lie here inside. Right. So which charge would it enclose? It will enclose the first charge. But 2 and the second and third charge are outside. Now if I take R equal to 5, that is this green circle, it will enclose the first and second charge. But the third charge is outside. That's all. Once you draw this figure, as I told you, drawing the figure is very important. So for R, R at 1, it will be 0. And for R at 3, for any radius between 2 and 4, on the left-hand side of Gauss's law, I have 4 pi R squared. That is the area of the Gaussian surface into dr. 
this is equal to what charge does it enclose it encloses the first charge so 4 pi the first charge lies at 2 mm so it is 4 uh, sorry 2 meters it is 4 pi r squared 2 squared into the charge density the first charge density is 20 nano coulombs per meter square clear so on my left hand side I have the area of the Gaussian surface on my right hand side it is the area of the charged surface so dr is 18 nano coulombs divided by r squared per meter square okay this is for any point r between 2 and 4 so now at r equal to 3 I have to apply this I get it now similarly for any points here see here in bit here it will enclose these two this is this is at a radius of 2 meters and this is at a radius of 4 meters therefore the total charge enclosed would be 4 pi 2 square that is the inner sphere into its charge density plus 4 pi 4 squared that is the outer sphere into its charge density and what do I have on the left hand side 4 pi r squared what is r the radius of the Gaussian surface so for all points 4 less than r less than 6 this is the expression I get the expression for dr now if I want to find out at 5 I just substitute r equal to 5 and calculate dr now there's a third part to the question determine rho s naught you remember the outer the sphere the charge density was not specified such that d is equal to 0 at all points if r is greater than 6 meters okay so if r is greater than 6 meters what are the charges it would enclose the this is the charge due to the what i calculated here the flux density due to the first two spherical surfaces plus this would be the density due to the third spherical surface this should be zero so from this i can calculate rho s naught that works out to be minus 4 by n nano coulombs per meter square obviously it has to be negative because remember if my flux density has to be zero the total charge enclosed should be zero right and now the first two spheres are positively charged therefore the third sphere must be negatively charged if i want to make the total charge equal to zero so that way you can have an indication whether you know you can apply logic to find out whether your answer is right or wrong yeah so now we i think now you are clear about um, application of Gauss's law to different uh, kinds of uh, configurations okay so now before we proceed uh, let me just tell you the whatever we have been using the form of Gauss's law what was that the closed integral of d dot ds is equal to q enclosed that's the formula I have used that's called as the integral form of Gauss law now if I want to convert it into differential form then I do the following first I use the divergence theorem remember we, we saw the divergence theorem in vector calculus so what does the divergence theorem do the divergence theorem converts the divergence theorem converts or gives me the relationship between a surface integral and a volume integral so integral closed integral of d dot ds over a surface is equal to the volume integral of the divergence now be very clear you remember we discussed any closed surface whether a sphere or a cylinder or an arbitrary closed surface like this any closed surface encloses a volume so on my left hand side I have the surface integral of a vector over this closed surface now this is equal to the volume integral of the divergence of the vector over the volume what volume the volume enclosed by this surface integral by this closed surface whatever is the volume this closed surface encloses that is the volume over which I have to take the integral so this is divergence law now if I take charge enclosed so this is the left hand side of your Gauss's law in integral form 
Now the right hand side is QN closed. QN closed in a general fashion I can write is equal to integral of rho V dot dV over the volume. What is rho V? The volume charge density. So obviously the total charge is enclosed. The total charge enclosed in a volume is equal to the integral of the volume charge density over the entire volume. That's from the fundamental definition of charge. So now these two are equal from Gauss's law. Integral of d dot ds is equal to q enclosed. We have already shown that. Now integral of d dot ds is equal to volume integral of the divergence of d and the q enclosed is volume integral of the volume density. So I can equate these two and I get integral the divergence of d is equal to the volume integral of the volume charge density. So from these, I'm talking of the same volumes here is equal to, I can get the relationship, divergence of D is equal to rho V. And from the relationship, D is equal to epsilon naught E in free space, I can say in free space, the divergence of E is equal to rho V by epsilon naught. Okay, so this is also Gauss's law. It's called as the Gauss's law in differential form. Integral d dot ds is equal to q enclosed is called as Gauss's law in integral form. The divergence of d is equal to rho v is the Gauss's law in differential form. Okay, very important. We'll be using this subsequently uh, in some uh, cases. Clear? So I think by now you are uh, quite clear about how to apply Gauss's law, how to choose a Gaussian surface and uh, you know how to apply Gauss's law to find the flux density or the electric field intensity due to different charge configurations. So we have done with Cartesian, with cylindrical, with spherical and with the uh, uh, you know constant uh, volume co constant charge densities and with variable charge densities so i think i have covered almost all the uh, different cases you can see so now let's move on to the next very interesting uh, topic of energy now you know that whenever energy is directly related to the work done yes so whenever you want to do work, some energy has to be expended, right? So now, do you think electric fields have a force? Of course. How did I define the E field? I defined the E field as the force that would be experienced by a unit positive charge if it is placed in the field, right? It's a force field. The electric field intensity is a force field. So now let's see here, I've tried again, I'm not very good at uh, figures, but I've tried to put something so that you understand. So now this is my electric field. Let's say this is my electric field. So now what do you, if I, let us say I, I keep a charge here, right? So what, what is the, effect? So let us assume the charge is free to move. So what would happen, what would happen to the charge? So the charge will experience a force, right? What is the force it would experience? it would experience a force equal to Q into E. What is Q? Q is the charge which I am placing into E. Why? Because E is the charge, e, sorry, E is the force which a unit positive charge will experience. Repeat, E is the force which a unit positive charge experiences. So if you place a charge Q, it will experience a force Q into E. Agree? Fine. So if I keep a charge Q here, this field E will exert a force Q E on it, right? And that charge will tend to accelerate if it is free to move. Yes? And how, what will be its acceleration? Obviously, there are two forces it, which it has to balance. The force I am applying is Q E right that should be equal to mass into acceleration so that is the acceleration you can find out right so if i if the charge has to move in this direction i don't have to do any work the force will push push it the e field will push the charge and it will start moving clear 
but now just think i want to move a charge in this direction in this direction okay if i want to move a charge against the field what happens the field is trying to push the charge like this and i am trying to move it in the opposite direction so it's like friction you know it's like friction so friction is applying a force in one direction you want to move in the opposite direction so obviously you have to apply a force equal and opposite to what the friction is applying on you agreed so therefore the um, what should i say the take away from this discussion is that if you possibly are only talk considering positive charges if you want to move a positive charge in the direction of an electric field you don't have to expend any work it will move automatically the field itself will move it but you have to expend some energy or you need an external source to move a charge against a field against an electric field agree and in which direction i have to push it in the opposite direction so now let's see if i can we la love maths right let's see if we can put everything in maths okay the force on a charge q coulombs placed in an electric field is q into e okay again be very clear who is applying this force the electric field is applying this force right okay this is the force exerted by the field on the charge now the component of the force in the di in a direction dl is given by qe dot al al is a unit vector so if i want the direction of this force obviously it is q into e dot al where al is a unit vector along dl right so if we have to move a charge q we must ex expend an equal and opposite force to overcome the force due to this field what is the work done the work done is minus qe dot dl this is nothing force f dot dl is the work done that's all i have used that don't get confused f dot dl is the work done in moving a, any moving a particle or moving a body from one point to another point over a distance of dl so here f is minus qe why that minus because i have to oppose the electric field this work is zero i have three cases now i have something very interesting when will this term become zero trivial case and when when either q is zero e is zero or dl is zero that is fine and a non trivial case when e dot dl is zero right and when will e dot dl be zero when e the vector e and the vector dl are perpendicular clear yes fine because cos theta angle will be 90 degree yeah if we now move the charge over a finite distance then the work done to move it from point b to point a okay point b is initial point point a i am moving from b to a w is equal to minus q b a e dot dl again why this minus i have to move against the field the field is giving me a force so i have to oppose i have to overcome that force that's why the minus sign okay now if this field e is uniform remember gauss law i can choose surfaces on which it is uniform then i can take e outside the integral right so this becomes minus q e integral b to a dl and now what is integral d b to a dl it is simply i will write it as e dot lba lba is the vector from b to a that's why i have put it in bold lba is the vector distant distance vector from point b to point a right now the first thing i want you to notice here is that you know while this integral doesn't tell me anything much if this is a path integral from point b to a whereas here if you look at this this doesn't depend on the path i take from b to a i can go in circles round and round and round and again go from b to a or can i can just go from b to a i am only interested in the distance vector distance from b to a that's all 
not what path I take. Are you getting my point? So if I have two points like this, from here to here I can move like this, or I can move like this, or I can move like this, or I can move like this. Whatever you move, the work done is equal to minus QE dot LAB. Okay, that's a very important thing. So, the conclusion of this. If we are moving a charge in a uniform field, uniform field, remember, then the line integral becomes path independent. Now, what does this mean? If you look at this, all this was possible only because I assumed that E is a constant. So, I could take it outside the integral. But if E is inside, I cannot come to that conclusion. Okay, if E is not uniform. Okay. So, if we are moving a charge in a uniform field, then the line integral becomes path independent and depends only on the initial and final points. Okay. And uh, again, for your convenience, I have uh, put on the unit length vectors in the three coordinate systems dl is equal to dx ax plus dy ay plus dz az. This is in Cartesian and in cylindrical dl is equal to d rho a rho plus rho d phi a phi plus dz az and in spherical it is dr ar plus r d theta a theta plus r sin theta d phi a phi. So you, I, if you remember I told you you have to memorize all this okay you have to know how to work it out okay so we can uh, find out the work done like this due to different charge configurations i don't want to take up the line charge configuration because it will take some time and i don't want to confuse you so let's wind up today's uh, sessions uh, session the first part of it of course they were all problems and uh, all on application of gauss's law and again and again i tell you please draw the figure so you know the moment you draw the figure and the points under consideration then it is very clear to you to visualize what is the Gaussian surface okay and which are the charges which would lie within the surface and so on and uh, I have also worked out problems on uniform and non-uniform charge densities and we introduced the concept of uh, you know the work doing work in an electric field so if you want to move in the direction of if you want to move a charge in the direction of a field you don't have to expend any work any energy the charge itself will push it sorry the field itself will push the charge but if you want to move against an electric field then some external source has to expend some energy and this energy should be equal and opposite to the energy which the electric field exerts on the charge so the work done we saw is minus q integral of e dot dl if you want to move from point initial point to final point and if e is a constant i can take it out and it becomes a path independent integral so such integrals are called as path independent that means they do not depend on what path you take from one point to another point but only depend on the end points okay so tomorrow we'll move along and uh, look at energy required to move charges uh, in fields created by line, line charges, surface charges, etc. Thank you.